This sound file contains the spoken word version of a Wikipedia article on the Accurate News and Information Act. It is recorded by user S underscore Whistler, and the material was recorded on the 13th of March, 2012. Accurate News and Information Act, from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia, at en.wikipedia.org. The Accurate News and Information Act was a statute passed by the Legislative Assembly of Alberta, Canada, in 1937 at the instigation of William Aberhart's social, social Credit Government. It would have required newspapers to print clarifications of stories that a committee of social credit legislators deemed inaccurate and to reveal their sources on demand. The act was a result of the stormy relationship between Eberhardt and the press, which dated to before the 1935 election in which the Social Credit League was elected to government. Virtually all of Alberta's newspapers, especially the Calgary Herald, were critical of social credit, as were a number of publications from elsewhere in Canada. Even the American media had greeted Eberhardt's election with derision. Though the Act won easy passage through the social credit-dominated legislature, Lieutenant Governor of Alberta, John C. Bowen, reserved royal assent until the Supreme Court of Canada evaluated the Act's legality. In 1938's reference re-Alberta statutes, the Court found that it was unconstitutional, and it never became law. Contents Eberhardt and the Press Statute Aftermath Eberhardt and the Press Before the 1935 election William Eberhardt's Social Credit League, running candidates for the first time, won a large majority in the 1935 Alberta election on the strength of promises to use a new economic theory called social credit to end depression conditions in the province. It did so against the almost uniform opposition of the news media. Some of the province's major newspapers were loyal to one of the traditional parties. The Edmonton Bulletin, for example, had supported the Liberals since its inception. Eberhardt initially laid out his economic agenda in only vague terms, and by 1935 his opponents, including Premier Richard Gavin Reed and the United Farmers of Alberta, were trying to force him to commit to a specific plan. The Calgary Herald took up this call, going so far as to offer Eberhardt a full page to lay out his approach in detail. Eberhardt refused on the grounds that he considered the Herald's coverage of him to be unfair. He frequently attacked the newspaper in speeches around the province, and on the 28th of April suggested that his followers boycott it and other unfriendly newspapers. The boycott was successful to the extent that it drove at least one newspaper out of business. The Herald responded to the boycott by asking, Is everyone opposed to the political opinions and plans of Mr. Eberhardt to be boycotted? He has invoked a most dangerous precedent, and has given the people of this province a foretaste of the Hitlerism which will prevail if he ever secures control of the provincial administration. Shortly before the election, the Herald began to run cartoons by Stuart Cameron, a virulently anti eberhardt cartoonist. The day before the election, it ran one featuring a car labelled The People, travelling along Eberhardt Highway No. 1 and arriving at a railway crossing. A train labelled Common Sense was approaching from around the bend, along tracks labelled Fundamental Facts. Eberhardt leans out of the SC signal tower, advising the car, All clear. Don't stop, look, or listen. Though the Herald was the most stringent in its opposition to Eberhardt and social credit, the Bulletin, the Edmonton Journal, the Medicine Hat News, the Lethbridge Herald, and many smaller papers all, in the words of Athabasca University historian Alvin Finkel, attacked social credit viciously as a chimera which, if placed in power, would wreck Alberta's chances for economic recovery. Of the province's major papers, only the Calgary Albertan provided even lukewarm support. So frustrated were the social creditors with the newspaper's hostility that in 1934 they founded their own, the Alberta Social Credit Chronicle, to spread their views.
The Chronicle, in addition to acting as Eberhard's mouthpiece, carried guest editorials by such figures as British fascist leader Oswald Mosley and anti-Semitic priest Charles Coughlin. Post-election Media reaction to Social Credit's 1935 victory, in which it won 56 of 63 seats in the Legislative Assembly of Alberta, was almost uniformly negative. The Herald opinions that the people of Alberta have made a most unfortunate decision and may soon see the folly of it. Even the Albertan expressed its wish that Social Credit be first tried in Scotland or Ethiopia, or anywhere but Alberta. Reaction across Canada was also negative. The St. Catherine Standard called the results a nightmare that passeth all understanding, and the Montreal Star accused Albertans of voting for an untried man and a policy whose workings he ostentiously refused to explain before polling day. American newspapers were less restrained. The Chicago Tribune asked, Greetings to the Canadians. Who's loony now? And the Boston Herald's headline screamed, Alberta goes crazy. The relationship did not improve once Eberhard took office. In January 1935, H. Napier Moore wrote two articles for Maclean's, casting doubt on Eberhard's honesty and his ability to follow through on his election promises. The American Collier's Weekly ran a profile that mocked Eberhardt's appearance, taking note of his vast colourless face and his narrow left slanted mouth with soft extra heavy bloodless lips which don't quite meet and through which he breathes wetly. Finkel, finding fault with both sides of the Eberhardt press feud, states, The major newspapers of the province opposed virtually everything the government did. Virtually every reform instituted was made to sound more draconian than it actually was. The conservative views of the owners and editors often interfered with the objective presentation of news reports, although perhaps not to the extent that the government claimed. In many cases, the papers simply concentrated on the very real chaos and confusion in government ranks, and required few embellishments to make the government look bad. The Herald lured Stuart Cameron away from working on Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves to make him its first ever staff cartoonist. Cameron devoted himself full-time to the ridicule of Eberhardt. Though social credit staffer turned journalist historian John Barr argues that the media's hostility to Eberhardt may have benefited him politically by allowing him to depict the press as a mere tool of Eastern financial and commercial interests. By January 1936, Eberhardt was telling the listeners of his weekly gospel radio show that he was glad there will be no newspapers in heaven. To help combat the negative press, Eberhardt resolved to gain control of the Albertan, the one paper of note, to show him any support. He formed a company that acquired an option to purchase it, and used his radio program to promote the purchase of shares by social credit supporters. The other newspapers criticized him for using what was nominally a gospel program to promote stock sales. The plan came to naught, as most social credit supporters were too poor to buy newspaper stock. The only interested buyers were beneficiaries of government patronage, chiefly liquor interests. Even so, the Albertan became the official organ of social credit, an editorial decision that doubled its circulation. Eberhardt reacted bitterly to the media's hostility. In a September 20th, 1937 radio broadcast, he said of the press, These creatures with mental hydrophobia will be taken in hand and their biting and barking will cease. Four days later, a special session of the Legislative Assembly of Alberta opened, with the Accurate News and Information Act figuring prominently on its order paper. Statute the 1937 Social Credit Backbenchers' Revolt had forced Eberhardt to abdicate a portion of his power to the newly created Social Credit Board, which constituted five Social Credit Backbenchers charged with supervising a commission of experts. 
while the initial plan was to have this commission headed by c h douglas social credit's british founder douglas did not like eberhardt and did not view his approach to social credit as consistent with its true form he refused to come instead he sent two subordinates l d brine and g f powell these surrogates were charged with recommending legislation to implement social credit in alberta their first round of proposals which included measures imposing government control on banks and prohibiting any person from challenging the constitutionality of any alberta law in court without receiving the approval of the lieutenant governor in council was disallowed by the federal government the second round included the accurate news and information act the act empowered the chair of the social credit board to require a newspaper to reveal the names and addresses of its sources as well as the names and addresses of any writers including of unsigned pieces non-compliance would result in fines of up to one thousand dollars a day and prohibition on the publishing of the offending newspaper of stories by offending writers or information emanating from offending sources the act also required newspapers to print at the instruction of the chair of the social credit board any statement which has for its object the correction or amplification of any statement relating to any policy or activity of the government of the province the act was attacked by opposition politicians as evidence of the government's supposed fascism and alienated even the albertan the international press was also cutting one british paper referred to eberhardt as a little hitler later commenters had been no more favorable finkel calls the act evidence of the increasingly authoritarian nature of the eberhardt regime and even barr generally sympathetic to social credit calls it a harsh blow to free speech lieutenant governor john c brown mindful of the federal government's disallowance of the social credit board's earlier legislation reserved royal assent of the act and its companions until their legality could be tested at the supreme court of canada this was the first use of the power of reservation in alberta history and in the summer of nineteen thirty eight eberhardt's government announced the elimination of bowen's official residence his government car and his secretarial staff eberhardt's biographers david elliott and iris miller and ernest manning biographer brian brennan attributed this move to revenge for bowen's reservation of assent aftermath bowen put a stop to the accurate news and information act at least temporarily but eberhardt's fight against the press continued on march twenty fifth nineteen thirty eight a resolution of the social credit dominated legislature ordered that don brown a reporter for the edmonton journal be jailed during the pleasure of the assembly for allegedly misquoting social credit backbencher john lyle robinson on the inclusion of chiropractors in the workmen's compensation act bowen was never actually jailed the next day in response to negative publicity from across canada the legislature passed another resolution ordering the release of mr don c brown from custody in barr's view the government was made to look less ominous than silly around the same time the supreme court ruled on the reference re alberta statutes it found that the accurate news and information act along with the others submitted to it for evaluation was ultra vires beyond the powers of the alberta government in the case of the accurate news and information act the court found that the canadian constitution included an implied bill of rights that protected freedom of speech as being critical to a parliamentary democracy for its leadership in the fight against the act the pulitzer prize committee awarded the edmonton journal a bronze plaque the first time it honored a non-american newspaper Ninety-five other newspapers, including the Calgary Albertan, Edmonton Bulletin, Calgary Herald, Lethbridge Herald, and Medicine Hat News, were presented with engraved certificates. 